Okay, uh, those who are speaking, can you please mute your microphones? So yesterday when we started off, we introduced uh, what a physical quantity is and also what the whole aim is when you're doing your physics course and especially labs, that you have to carry out measurements of physical quantities, then you also have to record... Okay, I've got a problem. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, so we said that you have to record, you have to carry out measurements of physical quantities, and also you have to keep records. Some of you have already started doing this with your experiments and labs which you're doing, where you're measuring things and you're keeping records and later on you're going to analyze things. How do we know that you're correct or not? Well, you have to, your measurements basically have to be a reasonable estimate of a particular physical quantity you're interested in. Then we introduce the whole framework of measurements, which is the international system of units, which is used around the world. And we pointed out that in this international system of units, physical quantities are divided in groups. There's a group of seven physical quantities, which is known as the SI base quantities. And there's a, the rest of them, which are not in those seven. The rest of them are what we called the derived quantities and that we come up with these derived quantities by either doing multiplication or division of the SI base quantities. So basically that's what we said yesterday. We also pointed out that everything you're going to look at in your physics course is basically a physical quantity so it was very very important that you be aware that any physical quantity has got size which is magnitude and also has got a unit accompanying that size the unit is what tells us what physical quantity we are dealing with or you're talking about so if you say 10 seconds we know that this time is 10, the size is 10, the second is the unit of time. So you know that you're talking about time. If you say 10 kgs, we know that you're talking about time. If you say 10 meters, we know that you're talking about length. Are we clear? That's what we were saying yesterday when it comes to physical quantities. There has to be a size. There also has to be a unit accompanying that particular physical quantity. We proceeded to show under the SI system of units which ones, which physical quantities constitute the foundation of this SI system of units, which are the base quantities. So we look... Uh, Daliso Nkoa, can you switch off your microphone? That is so. Nkoa. Microphone. Yeah. Okay. So we looked at this table, which gives us what the base quantities are. The mass, the symbol is M, the unit name is kilogram, and the symbol is kg for the unit. Then the length, the symbol is little l. The unit name for the length is measured in meters. The symbol for the meter is M. Then time, the symbol is T. The unit for time is seconds. Then the symbol for the unit is S. Then electric current, the symbol for electric current is capital I. Then the name of the unit is ampere, and the unit symbol is capital A. We say that ampere is capital A because ampere is the name of a person. So units which are named after people in one way or another, they have to start with a capital letter. So in the case of ampere, we have got capital A. Then temperature, the symbol is capital T. Then the name of the unit for temperature is the Kelvin, and that is capital A. Then amount of substance, then the name of the, uh, the unit symbol is small n, then the name of the unit is small, and the unit symbol is that MOL, pronounced MOM. Then light intensity, that is capital I, then the unit name is Candela, that is Latin. The English pronunciation of that translation of the Candela is the candle.
So the English pronunciation of the candela is the candle and the symbol is CD. Okay. So we also mentioned that this international system of units was established in 1875 at a meeting where 17 countries met in France and they signed a treaty which is known as the International Treaty of the Meter on May 20. And after that, this is basically the adoption of from 20 countries to so many countries. I think nearly every country in the world now uses this system. Okay. Uh, we also highlighted the seven quantities, the seven base quantities, which make up the the the, the base quantities. Uh, that is mass, length, time, temperature, electric current, amount of substance, and light intensity. We have seen those. Okay. Then any other unit which is not among the seven, that is what's referred to as a derived physical quantity. So if you know something, a physical quantity in physics. But that particular physical quantity in physics is not on this list of seven. Then that physical quantity falls under a category of physical quantities known as derived physical quantities. And these derived physical quantities, we saw that they are obtained by doing a multiplication or by doing a division of the SI base quantities. Okay, unless people have got questions, please mute your microphone. We proceeded to look up. Yes? Hello. Sir. Yes. Um, um, can you give some of the examples which uh, are not uh, on the what, uh, that, uh, which are not among the close I said. If you know any physical quantity which is not yes. on this list, that physical quantity is a derived physical quantity. Yes. Are we clear? We are going to look at those examples of examples right. of these physical quantities later on. But for now, our focus is on base quantities. The mass, the length, the time, the electric current, temperature, amount of substance and light intensity. Any other physical quantity you know which is not on this list is considered to be a derived physical quantity. Are we clear? Okay, all right, all right. We're going to look it's at... Clear, sir. And also, if you have looked at your notes, if you have tried to look at your notes, you see examples down there of what these derived physical quantities are. Excuse yes? Me, sir. The what? What is not clear? Okay. Next, we proceeded to look at mass. How do we define mass in physics? We said that mass is a measure of inertia of a body. Okay? Mass is a measure of the inertia of a body and why are people not able to hear me can people hear what i'm saying we don't know so we can hear you sir okay then that's not really my then it's not a problem on my end then. We get you, sir. yes okay fine yes sir we can get you all right so we say that mass is a measure there's a what what so we said mass is a measure of the inertia of a body and inertia refers to the resistance of a body to change its speed or to change its position when a force is applied. That's what inertia is. So, if you apply a force, you're trying to push a particular object, or you're trying to pull a particular object, then that particular board object refuses to be pulled. In, in other case, it refuses to have its position changed. Or this particular object is moving with a certain speed. 
then you try to stop it, then it refuses to change its speed. That tells you that this particular body has got a higher value of inertia, which in turn tells you that this particular body has got a large value of mass. So in a nutshell, when it comes to mass, the amount of resistance a body is going to offer when you try to change its position or its speed depends on how much matter that particular body has. Okay? Mass, in a nutshell, refers to how much matter is in a particular body. And how do you find out if the amount of matter in a particular body, what, what it is, you need to try to push this particular body or you need to try to pull it so that you can try to change its position or its speed. Then we say mass is measured in kgs and the symbol is k, uh, sorry, in kilograms and the symbol is kg. And previously, the kg used to be defined in terms of this solid. If I can try to maximize a bit so that you can see there is this solid in this cylinder here. That solid in the cylinder is made of platinum and iridium. So that's what it was referred to as the international prototype kilogram. However, the definition of the kilogram has since changed. Since 20, 2019, the definition of the kilogram has changed. Now the people with the microphone, no, Samson Manza. What yes, what's the problem, Manza? I can't see what you. I can't see the the port you on the channel. I can only see you, sir. You can't see my screen, my presentation. Can you see the screen? Yes, I can't see the screen. Try to log out and come back in. Other people, can you see my screen? Okay, Mwanza tried to log out and come back in. Okay. So, yeah. So these days, the kilogram, which is the unit for mass, is defined in terms of Planck's constant. There is an effort to change how we define what the kilogram is, what a meter is, in terms of physical constants. Okay. We also looked at length. Okay. Length, we said, is the straight line distance between two points on an object. That's what we say, in that length is measured in meters. Length, like mass, used to be measured in terms of an object which is this bar. Okay? But since 2019, the definition of what a meter is has changed. These days, we define the meter as the distance traveled by light. We define the meter as the distance traveled by light in a vacuum in a time interval of 1 divided by 299,792,450 of a second. Why this number? This number is the speed of light in a vacuum. Light travels a distance of 299,792,450 meters in a second. When you round off this number, basically, this is a number which is 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters of a second. So we use the distance covered by light in a vacuum. We use the distance covered by light in a vacuum as the basis for defining what a meter is. The people, Tembo, uh, Afia, Nathan Mwanza, can you please switch off your microphones? I don't know how many times I'm going to say this. If you're not speaking, switch off your microphones. Otherwise, I'll be forced to throw you out of the class. Nathan Mwanza. Okay. Unless you've got a question, then you can unmute your microphone, then you ask. Otherwise, keep your microphone muted. So that you don't have electronic noise. Okay. So the definition of the meter is based on the speed of light. In one second, light travels a distance of three times ten to the power eight meters per second, which is basically 
300 million meters in a second. So if you get this distance of 300 million meters in a second, you divide it into 300 into equal parts, 300 million equal parts, like with this number, then you get how much light travels in a second, in, uh, sorry, uh, in one meter. So you get what the definition of the meter is. The next bit is time. Okay, there's a lot of time. What time you wake up and all that stuff. Uh, what time you're supposed to have your class. Uh, what time you're supposed to go to bed and that stuff. When it comes to physics, our interest in time is the duration when an event is happening. How long does an event occur for? If you are doing something in the lab, how long does it take to actually happen? That's what we're interested in. Okay. So there is time, but our interest in time, the kind of time we're interested in in physics is a duration or a period when an event happens. Two separate events, when you start something and when you end it. That period, when something is happening, that's the kind of time we're interested in. And it is measured in seconds. We define the second in terms of what's happening to an atom of cesium, and the, fol the, def the following is the definition of one second. One second is defined as a duration. A duration is a period. A duration of 9,192,631,770 periods of light emitted when an outermost cesium electron transits between two hyperfine levels of ground state cesium 113 so there is a mention of cesium which is an atom which happens to be radioactive and there's also a mention of electrons the outermost electron of cesium this one here when it changes energy levels when it changes energy levels this electron when it decides to come and join these guys here it emits light okay the reason is because for an electron to be in an energy level okay or an electron shell it needs to have a specific a fixed amount of energy so if this electron here the outermost electron in that particular electron where it is it requires a lot of energy to be there when it changes position from here to down the, the lower one it has got more energy than is required so it has to give up the extra energy and that extra energy is emitted as light okay the light which is being emitted is actually a wave light is a wave it also happens to be made of particles but our interest is in the wave part of light in the wave nature of the light being emitted if it's a wave then it has got wavelength then it has got wavelength there's also something called period waves have got wavelength and also period so the period we are talking about here, this is the period of the light emitted when this electron changes energy levels or changes any shells, electron shells. It is a very, very small amount of time. Then we multiply that by this value, 9 billion, 192, uh, 9 billion, 192,631,770. And this is what gives us one second. So you can imagine how small this period is if we have to multiply by nine billion. Okay, so that's basically what the that's how we define a second after 2019 when this meeting was held. So a second is quite a very very small duration of time. Quite small. Any questions on what the second is and what time is? The kind of time we're interested in? The time of we're interested in is a duration. We are not interested in what time you wake up. Say, I wake up at six hours or I wake up at five. We're not interested in that kind of time. Okay? The kind of time we're interested in is an interval between the start and the finish of an event or the duration when a particular thing is happening. That's what... The, that's the kind of time we're interested in in physics. Is that clear? Yes, sir, it's clear. Yes, 
Good. Then we move on to yes. temperature. Okay. Now, in in every day or in a layman's term, in day to day life, you would define the temperature as the degree of hotness or the degree of coldness of a particular thing on a scale. Most likely, you would say uh, 25 degrees Celsius. The Celsius thing that is a scale. Or the water is very hot, 70 degrees solution, stuff like that. So you're trying to tell us how hot or how cold something is. Okay? But that's not the kind of temperature we are interested in in physics. In physics, when you talk about temperature, we actually mean a special type of temperature called thermodynamic temperature. thermodynamic temperature that's what we when we say temperature in physics this is the kind of temperature you're interested in this thermodynamic temperature thermodynamic temperature measures the total energy of all the atoms which make up a substance if you've got an object we go inside this object we measure the energy of each and every atom which make up this substance then we add that total energy is what is measured when you talk about when, when we were speaking about thermodynamic temperature okay so thermodynamic temperature is a measure of the total internal energy of an object the total internal energy the internal energy of an object is the energy of all the atoms which make up an object so everything all the energy which this particular object has as a result of the atoms it has that's referred to as internal energy and since you can't go inside the atom you can't do antman things you need a way of finding out how much energy a particular object has and that's what this thermodynamic temperature does Thermodynamic temperature is measured in kelvins. Okay. Your normal temperature is measured in degrees solutions. When you talk about thermodynamic temperature, it's measured in kelvins. It's talking about all the energy which the atoms have in a particular object. So the more energy a particular object has, the higher the temperature, this thermodynamic temperature. Are we clear? The more energy atoms have, or molecules which make up an, an object, then the higher the temperature. Okay. And how do we define a Kelvin? We define a Kelvin in terms of something called the triple point of water. Water was chosen because water on this planet is very, very common. Every, nearly everybody can afford to find water. But in some places, of course, I understand water is a bit difficult to find. So, what do we mean by the triple point? Well, as you can see in this glass which you have here, in this glass, there are ice cubes. That is a solid phase of water. Then you can see there is liquid, the water itself. Then there are also gas bubbles. So the water in this glass is existing as a solid, as a liquid, and as a gas. When a substance exists as a solid, as a liquid, and as a gas, we say it's at a, its triple point. Triple point meaning that in this particular substance, you can find a solid, you can find the liquid. And there's a gas, and you can find the gas. When a substance exists as a solid, as a gas, and as a liquid in the same container, like in this case, in this class, you can see the ice cubes. That's a solid part of the water. You can see the liquid. You can also see the gas bubbles. Excuse this. Me, sir. I can't get what you're saying. You can't get what I'm saying. Any other people can't get what I'm saying? Oh. 
Okay. Okay. I get you very clear. I can get you as well. Okay. So, this condition, this condition where the water exists as a solid, as a liquid, and as a gas, which is the triple point, exists at a, at a thermodynamic temperature of 273.1516, somewhere there. 1516 kelvins. This temperature corresponds in degrees Celsius, corresponds to 0 0.01 degrees and at a pressure of 0 0.61 kilopascals. So the pressure of the environment has to be 0 0.61 kilopascals and the temperature has to be this. So you can see 273.1273 kelvins is a very, very, very small temperature. Yes, the number in kelvins, it looks large. But in the reality to what we are used to, the equivalent of 273, 273 kelvins is 0, 0 0.01 degrees solution. So this is a very, very low temperature. Then when it comes to the pressure in kilopascals, the air you are breathing right now, wherever you are, okay, the air pressure is 101 kilopascals. The pressure of your air which is getting in your body and out of your body as you breathe in and out. The pressure of the air you're breathing in is 101 kilopascals. That is what is referred to as atmospheric pressure. So, for you to have 0 0.61 kilopascals, you basically need to pump out the air in this container where you've got this thing until there is as little air as possible. So, the first thing is you need to reduce the temperature to 273 kelvins which is equivalent to 0 0.01 degrees Celsius you also need to reduce the pressure for you to have this condition okay so if the triple point of water is 273.16 kelvins in as in thermodynamic temperature of that then you divide the triple point the thermodynamic temperature of water, you divide it in, or you multiply it by one over this, then what you end up with is a Kelvin. So basically, this is a definition of what thermodynamic temperature is. Okay. The temperature you measure in degrees Celsius, the one when you go to your clinic, we measure you in degrees Celsius. That is not the thermodynamic temperature. Okay. That is the temperature in Celsius. That is a derived quantity you can obtain that from this thermodynamic temperature are we clear with what we mean by temperature now the total kinetic and the total energy of all the atoms which make up an object of course if the energy is higher then when you touch this object with a, a higher energy it feels hot if the energy is lower when you touch a particular ob that, that particular object, it feels cold. So the, the hotness or the coldness is because you are trying to touch this object which has got uh, this uh, internal energy stuff. Are we clear? Are we clear on what we mean by temperature? Yes, we are. Yes, this hotness yes, and coldness, are, yeah, yeah. this hotness and coldness business, for you to feel how hot something is, for you to feel how cold something is, if you touch something which is very hot, you might end up being bent. So basically, it's not even a very good way of measuring things, going around touching things, whether something is hot or something is cold. Maybe something is very cold, then you touch it with your fingers, you might get a, what you call a frostbite or something like that. So you end up having your fingers cut off something like that. So we measure temperature differently in physics in terms of all the energy of the atoms which make up this particular object. We get all that energy, we add it, then the value, final value of energy, that's what is known as the internal energy. This internal energy can be converted into a number on a scale of temperature which is known as the thermodynamic temperature. Of course, during the course of the year, we're going to look at what temperature is later in more detail and how we define it. Something related to temperature is heat. 
Okay? Heat and temperature are not the same thing. Are we clear? Heat and temperature are not the same thing. Heat is related to temperature, but they're not the same thing. When you have a what you consider to be a hot object, okay? When you have a hot object, then you put this hot, hot object next to a cold object. The hot object, more accurately, we can say that the hot object has got more total internal energy. The internal energy of the hot object is more than the internal energy of the cold object. So the cold object has got a small value of internal energy. The hot object has got a larger value of internal energy. So when you put a hot object, that is on core, your microphone, Musa, what, Musa Kabanba, your microphones, please. I don't know how many times you're going to say this. That is on core, please switch off your microphone. Musa Mkamba, your microphone also. If you can't switch off your microphones, I have to remove you from the class. That is all. Okay. Okay. So, when you put a hot object next to a cold object, what we consider to be a hot object it is because that particular object has got a larger value of internal energy the cold object has got a smaller value of internal energy so some of this energy from the hot object is going to be transferred to the cold object when it's transferred to the cold object the hot object will reduce in hotness then the cold object is going to warm up a bit the the internal energy transferred from the hot object to the cold object the amount of internal energy transferred from the hot object to the cold object that is what we refer to as heat heat is internal energy which moves or it flows because previously people used to think heat was a liquid some kind of a liquid called caloric okay so heat is internal energy which moves from an object or into an object. That's what you refer to as heat. So that's the difference between heat and internal energy. Uh, sorry, heat and uh, thermodynamic temperature. Thermodynamic temperature is a measure of the total internal energy of an object. Heat, on the other hand, is the part of the internal energy which is transferred when an object is in contact, when a hot object is in contact with a cold object. Some of the internal energy from the hot object will be transferred to the cold object as heat. Okay, next we move on to... Are there any questions before we move on? On what heat is? No, no question. Yes, okay, sir. next we move on to electric currents. Now, electric currents is defined as follows. The rate of flow of electric charge past a point to a region. So there's something called electric charge. And this electric charge passes through a point or something like that. Now, to talk about, when you talk about electric current, you have to go back to how an atom is organized. Okay. You have to go back to how an atom is organized. So at the center of the atom, you've got a nucleus, and this nucleus has got protons and neutrons. The protons have got something called positive charge. Okay, Then, going around the nucleus are these electrons. Okay, A lot of these electrons. The more, the further away, so these electrons have something called negative charge. The negative charge which an electron has is 1 negative minus 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 18 coulombs. That's what the size of the charge which an electron has. It also happens that the, proton, the, the protons at the nucleus also have got the same amount of charge. So, there is an attraction 
between the electrons and the protons at the, which live in the nucleus. Was there a question? So I was saying there is an attraction between the electrons going around the nucleus and the protons inside. This attraction is what is known as uh, electrostatic stuff, an electrical, yeah, electrostatic force or something like that. Okay. However, these electrons going around the nucleus are not the cause of electricity because Come on, every object has got atoms, and those atoms have got protons and electrons. For example, rubber or wood or a stone. It has got it's made up of atoms and these atoms have got electrons. But you don't find stones conducting electricity. You don't find wood conducting electricity. So the fact that Wanza, you seem to be the only one who can't get me. It's, I don't think it's a problem on my side. It must be a problem on your end. I think I'm speaking clear enough. She's not the only one. Who is not getting you? Who's not getting me? So there's an option here called... Um, turn it on and get what you make. Whatever you're saying will be written. So even they can't yeah, at least they, they can read what you're saying. Okay, so fine. Yeah. So the fact that an a substance has got atoms does not mean that does not necessarily mean that it can conduct electricity or it can allow a current to pass through it. For a substance to conduct electricity, it needs to have something called free electrons now these free electrons usually tend to be the outermost electrons okay like in this case this one so this outermost electron is going to be lost so this atom is going to lose the outermost electron and this electron once it's lost in a substance it's going to become like a street kid it doesn't have a home where it belongs but it still doesn't want to go back home okay so when an atom loses an electron this the remaining atom becomes something called an ion and since it has lost an electron which had negative charge what is the atom left behind becomes something called a positive ion okay the electron which has been lost is free to move around the atom around around the the material or the substance and in certain materials in certain substances especially metals a lot of atoms literally billions of atoms lose electrons okay so you have basically billions of these electrons which have been lost from particular atoms moving around in a random fashion in a substance so when these free electrons these lost electrons when they move they have in their pocket something called they're carrying something called electric charge okay it's a very small amount of electric charge minus 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 18 coulombs very very small but because there are billions of them as they pass through a particular point or a region then we count how much electric charge has passed through as these electrons are passing through then that's what constitutes what is known as electric current is this clear on what we think electric current is? It is the amount of charge passing through a point. This charge is being carried by free electrons. Okay? And each electron carries a very, very small amount of charge. 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 18 coulombs. Are we clear? Okay, so that is electric current. Electric current has to do with the flow. 
electric current has to do with the flow of electrons. Electrons need to pass through a point. As those electrons are passing, each electron is carrying a small amount of something called a physical quantity, something called electric charge. Minus 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 18 coulombs. Previously, the definition of electric charge of a current, and current is measured in amperes, okay? Amperes, named after uh, André Marie Pierre, some French scientists. Previously, the definition of an umpire was such that if you got, first of all, this whole thing needed to be in a vacuum. So you needed to create a vacuum. Then after you create a vacuum, in that vacuum, you pass two wires, long wires, at least one meter. So one meter, one meter, then these wires, one meter apart. So you pass in this vacuum, you create a vacuum, then you in this vacuum, you pass these one meter wires then you place them one meter apart. Then you pass a current through these wires in the same direction. Now the thing about current is when electrons are moving, they create something called a field, an electric field. So there's an attraction between these electrons that are moving. So these wires are going to attract each other. The pre if the force of attraction between these two wires as the current was passing through was 2 times 10 to the power minus 14 newtons. This is a very, very small force of attraction. If you measured the attractive force and it turned out to be 2 times 10 to the power minus uh, 10 to the power minus 7 newtons, then you would say that the current passing through the wires was 1 ampere. However, this was very difficult to reproduce because remember, you needed a vacuum then you needed long wires and somehow you needed to have a way of measuring this attractive force which was very very difficult so after 2019 the definition of what an umpire is was changed it was no longer based on this experiment but it became based on something called Holmes law okay. now Holmes law is very very simple Holmes law says that if you measure, if you have a wire, okay, one end of this wire and the other end of the wire, if you measure the voltage across this wire, then you also measure the current. So the voltage across the wire and the current passing through the wire, there is a relationship there, okay? And how are they related? Like this. The voltage across the wire is equal to the electric current passing through the wire times something called electric resistance or the resistance. So like this, so V is equals to the current multiplied by the resistance. So if you want to find the current, basically what you have to do is you have to measure the voltage and you find the resistance of the wire. So you divide the voltage and the resistance, then you find how much current is. Okay, so based on this definition, we could redefine what an umpire is to say, if you have a voltage of one volt, then the resistance is one ohm of the conductor. Whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be one volt. Let's say the voltage is 10 volts. Then the resistance of the wire is 10 ohms. So you're going to have 10 volts divided by 10 ohms. That's going to give you a current of one ampere. Okay? So, this new definition of an umpire based on Holmes law is very easy for anyone to do because the only thing you need to do is you get your voltmeter, you measure the voltage, then you also get your multimeter, you measure the resistance. So you, have, you can easily measure the resistance of the wire or your conductor, then you can also measure the voltage. Then you divide the voltage by the resistance, then you find your current. So if it turns out that your current is one, then that's what you want. That's what you have as you, you think. Are we clear? Are we clear on this definition? Okay. Again, we are just starting out. 
okay we are just starting out some of you probably want to study electrical engineering and stuff so as the year pro progresses we're going to go to a topic of electricity where we're going to define we're going to talk more about what an umpire is and stuff like that for the time being it's enough to know what electric current is to say when we're talking about electric current we're basically measuring how much electric charge is passing through a point and that electric current is measured in amperes are we clear for now this is enough okay the other thing which we want to talk about is uh before i do that there is this um amount of substance okay there is supposed to be a thing i don't know how it's not here but i need to fix that so you, i think later on during the course of the week during the weekend i'll fix this note so that you get an updated set of the notes because this as you can see there is nothing called amount of substance which has been discussed here now i want to talk about amount of substance before i move on to light intensity amount of substance and mass they are not the same thing mass has to do with how much matter a substance has an object has and for you to find out to for you to come to the conclusion that this particular object has got a lot of mass or it has got less mass you need to try to push that particular object or you need to try to stop it if the object is moving you try to stop it the more difficulty you have stopping an object then you conclude that it is more massive if an object is stationary then you try to push it then you're having difficulty pushing it it's difficult to push then you conclude that this object has got mass so mass is a measurement of inertia another amount of substance on the other hand deals with the number of atoms the number of molecules or the number of ions in a substance that's what amount of substance deals with you literally count how many atoms how many ions or how many molecules of a substance you have then you're talking about amount of substance now there is a very specific definition of amount of substance the definition of amount of substance is based on an element called carbon 12. now this carbon 12 yes it sounds very scary but it's not because carbon 12 is charcoal malasha when there's lot shedding then you go then you're sent to the market to go and buy charcoal the charcoal you're buying that charcoal you're buying that's what is referred to as carbon 12. are we clear yes sir. yes the charcoal yeah. you buy at the market yeah. Yeah. that is what is referred to as carbon 12. okay now if you get malasha then you grind the malasha so that the malasha becomes a powder okay you get the malasha then you grind the malasha then it becomes a powder then you get 12 grams okay you get 12 grams of that charcoal you nicely you wake as careful as you can be 12 grams that 12 grams of charcoal is what is referred to as one more are we clear when you get 12 grams of charcoal that 12 grams of charcoal is what is referred to as one more of a substance one more of charcoal are you am i clear on what i'm saying the 12 grams of charcoal has a fixed number of atoms six point i think six point one three times 10 to the power 23 that the number of atoms in 12 grams uh salman goma microphone yes the number of atoms the number of molecules in 12 grams of charcoal that is what is referred to that number avogadro's number six Twenty, is it something two three times ten to the power 23 so you've got six times ten to the power 23 atoms in 12 grams of charcoal 
and that forms the best the basis for the definition of what a more is one more of any substance has got the same number of atoms six times ten to the power 23 atoms or molecules since atoms or molecules have different masses then it also turns out that for different elements Sorry, for you, sir. yes go ahead uh, i didn't get the point where you said when you pack charcoal when you grind charcoal into a powder then you weigh 12 grams of it okay that 12 grams is what we call a mole 12 grams of charcoal is what you call a mole are we clear okay yes that 12 grams has a certain number of atoms 6 times 10 to the power 23 or Avogadro's number I don't know if you know the Avogadro's number from chemistry yes we know it yes that number that Avogadro's number that Avogadro's number gives you how many atoms or how many molecules it's telling you that Avogadro's number tells you how many atoms or how many molecules are in one more of any substance so when it comes to amount of substance you literally need to count how many atoms once you come up with the number of atoms which is equal to the Avogadro's number then you say you have got one more of a particular substance are we clear Are we clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then, the other thing I want to mention is your periodic table, chemistry periodic table. Okay? Do you know your periodic table? I'm assuming you have your, your, your periodic table yeah. from chemistry. If you don't know your periodic table, then after this class, Pass by the chemistry labs, you'll find some charts where there's an element, then there's a number at the bottom. The number at the bottom is what is called the atomic number. Okay? That atomic number basically tells you how many electrons or how many protons that particular element has. But there's also a number on top which has got decimal points. That number is what is known as the mass number or the molar mass. Basically, that tells you how many grams of that particular element you need for you to have one more of a substance. Am I clear? Let me try to Let me try find to... a find a periodic table. Find a periodic table if I can find one. Periodic table of elements. If I can find a quick one. Yes. Just a minute. I'm trying to find a nice periodic table and I'm not succeeding. Just a minute. Can you see my screen? I hope you're seeing my screen. I want to find a nice periodic table so that we can we can see. Okay, this is not good. Okay, let me see. If I can try to zoom. Can you see my zoomed periodic table? Yes, yes we can. Okay. I can try to do okay, five hundred. So basically, for example, uh which one? Uh this is carbon. Yes, carbon here. This is carbon. Okay, this is carbon. Then there's a six there. That six tells you how many protons carbon has and how many electrons it has. Then there's a number at the bottom here. It says 12 grams here. 
12 grams, 12.00. That 12.00 is how many grams of carbon you need for you to have one more. Okay? Then you go to nitrogen. Nitrogen, there is seven. That's a number of protons. Then, they, then there's a number at the bottom there. Okay? That number at the bottom with a, with a point tells you how many grams of that particular element you need for you to have one more. So that's how you know how much of a particular element you need to weigh out for you to have one more of that particular element. Are we clear? You go on your periodic table after this class, pass through the chemistry department, then you see the numbers. Okay? The ones with the decimal points. That tells you how many grams of that element you need for you to have one more. Any questions? On what makes up one more of a substance? Yes. Yes, the molecular number, the thing, the molecular number thing on your periodic table, that's equals to one more. If you measure uh, that many grams, that molecular thing, you measure the, 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 the grams of that thing, that will give you one more of a substance. That's what you're trying to say. In that one more of a substance, the number of atoms which will be there will be equal to Avogadro's constant. Are we clear? Okay, so pass through the chemistry department. Go and see for different elements what is the mass you need for you to have one more of this particular element. Okay, the last uh, base quantity you're going to look at is something called light intensity. Now, the definition of light intensity is sounds a bit intimidating. It says luminosity per solid angle, but I'll try to explain this as much as I can. Now, light intensity the definition of light intensity is based on two things it is based on one the source of light then two where the light is falling okay there has to be something emitting light then that light being emitted needs to fall on a particular surface okay now luminosity refers to the amount of light energy being emitted in all directions per second. That's what luminosity is. So if you look at your light in your room, how much energy that bulb or that fluorescent is emitting in all directions per second, that is what you refer to as luminosity. And luminosity is measured in watts. So if your light finishes in your room or in your house, you go to the shop or you go to shop right to buy lights. You probably you want to buy a six watt bulb or a 7 watt bulb or a 9 watt bulb or a 12 watt bulb that 6 watt is the luminosity of the source of light that 12 watts is the luminosity it means that in every second if you are buying a 6 watt bulb this source of light this bulb is going to be emitting 6 jaws of visible light in every direction are we clear on the luminosity part Are we clear on what luminosity is? And how it's measured? No, sir, that is the definition of luminosity. Luminosity is the watts yes, of your bulb. Clear. The watts of your bulb. Your 6 watts, 12 watts, 9 watts, that watt thing. The more watts a bulb has, you believe the brighter it's going to emit light. Okay? So, luminosity is how much visible light, the amount of visible light emitted by a source of light in all directions per second. When you talk about luminosity, you're talking about the light you can see. There's light you can't see. Infrared, x-rays, radio waves, all these things, UV. You can't see that light. But when you're talking about luminosity, you're talking about the light you can see with your eyes. That's what's referred to as visible light. Okay, this visible light, this luminosity is measured in watts. 
So you go to the shop to buy a bulb. You, the, the guy is going to ask you, how many watts do you want? I want six watts, or I want three watts, or you want nine watts, or you want 12 watts. That wattage is what we, that's a measure of luminosity. And as you can see, luminosity is not in that table of base quantity. So luminosity is not a base quantity. But we are using something which is not a base quantity to define something here. Okay. The next thing is solid angle. So we have got the luminosity, which is in watts. Let's say 12 watts or 9 watts. That's the luminosity. Okay. How much visible light is being emitted by source of light per second in all directions. The next thing is a solid angle. Now, solid angle has to do with where the light is falling. Okay. If you buy a torch, you go to the shop, you buy a torch. Okay. Then you switch on your torch. Then you move as it, as it comes on. Then you move your torch closer to the wall. You will notice that as you move your torch closer to the wall, the area on which the light from the torch is falling reduces. Okay? So we are interested in that area on which the light is falling. Okay? We are also interested in the distance from the, the torch to the wall. That's what this is. Solid angle. Solid angle is the area, the area on which the light from the torch is falling divided by the radius squared, the distance from where the light is falling to the source of light, the torch. Okay, so the area is going to be measured in meter squared. This radius, when it, radius is, is a distance, is a length, it's measured in meters, then when you square it, you get meter squared. So you're dividing meter squared per meter squared. So basically, you have got something like this. This is what we're talking about. So this is the area on which the light... No, sir. Hello? When they ask you to find solid angle, uh -huh. can you give the, the radius, the value for the radius? Oh, so when we ask you to find the solid angle, we give you the area on which the light is falling and the distance from the source of light. That's all you need. The area and the distance from the source of light. So here, here this diagram is saying if the area is equal to the radius squared. Okay? Are you, have you seen this? A equals to radius squared. If the area, this area, is equal to the radius squared, then what you have is what is known as one stair radian. This is how the solid angle is measured. So if the area on which your light is falling is equal to the distance squared from the source of light, then you have yourself one stair radian. So the solid angle is equal to one stair radian. Because solid angle is measured in stair radians. Is this clear? From this diagram. For one stair radian, this omega, this omega thing here, this is a symbol for solid angle. So here it says the solid angle is equal to one stair radian. How is it equal to one stair radian? This area, this orange part, has to be equal to the radius squared. Is this clear? Are we clear on this one? Okay. I'll give another example of this thing. Most of you have got your flashlights, right? You have got your phones, right? Most of you have got phones. And those phones have got a flashlight. Sorry? I'm saying most of you have got a phone. And that phone has a flashlight. Okay? So that flashlight has got a certain amount of watts. I don't know how many watts. Uh, it, they, it, they don't really say, but your flashlight has got a certain amount of watts because it emits light in a particular direction. That's fine. When you get your flashlight on, then you move your flashlight closer to your skin. Okay? You switch on your flashlight for your phone. Then you move your flashlight closer to your skin. 
what you are doing is you are reducing the distance between your skin which is the surface on which the light is falling and the source of light so basically this r squared you are making it smaller okay so you are making your r squared smaller at the same time the area on which your flashlight is falling the light from your flashlight the area as you move closer to your skin the area reduces so very very soon if you put your flashlight on your skin you are going to feel that your light is burning you okay you're going to feel a burning sensation from the light have you ever felt that those guys who those people who put your phones in their pocket have you ever felt a time when you have put your phone in your pocket then the flashlight on its own switches on then it starts to burn your skin have you ever felt that yes that, that burning you feel that is what we call light intensity the yes the burning you feel is what we call light intensity however that burning is going to reduce when you move the flashlight away from your skin okay when you move your flashlight away from your skin then the burning sensation reduces so light intensity basically is the burning sensation a source of light produces when it's near you and this this sensation is going to reduce when you move away the source of light that is what light intensity is and how do we determine it the light intensity it is the luminosity so how many watts your source of light has divided by the solid angle how do you get the solid angle you check out what is the area on which the light from the source of light is falling the area so imagine here you have got a bulb at the center here you put a bulb at the center so if the light from this bulb is falling on this area this is a then the distance from the source of light to the area the distance squared that is what gives you the solid angle so the light intensity the luminosity divided by the solid angle that's what gives you light intensity and the light intensity is measured in candelas so one candela basically one candela is equals to one watt per steradian are we clear is it more clear on what the solid angle is supposed to be Are we clear? Any questions? Uh, Leonard, I haven't heard anything. Okay. So, now that we have sorted out these base quantities, yes. No, on the solid angle, how to obtain it, I didn't get that. How do you obtain solid angle? You need a source of light, like a torch. Okay? You switch, you switch on your torch, you shine your torch on the wall. Then you mark out the area where the light is falling. So the area where the light is falling, that is your A. So you switch on your torch, you shine it on the wall, then the area, where the, the area on the wall where the light is falling, you mark it out, that is your area. Then this arrow, this arrow, this arrow is the, the distance from the wall to the torch. Are we clear? So the distance from the wall to the torch is squared. That's how you get your solid angle. You have to have a source of light. This source of light, you put your, in this case, here, you put a source of light at the center here. The source of light is going to shine like a torch. Is going to shine on this area here that's the area a then this area from the source of light the distance is arrow you can see the arrow there can you see the arrow this arrow yes so the area on which the source of light is falling on the area on which the light is falling you get that area you measure it i don't know how you're going to measure it whether it's a square or it's a circle but you measure this area then you divide that area 
by the distance from that area to where the light is coming from. But this distance has to be squared. Here, the distance has to be squared, R squared. That's how you get your solid angle. Radius squared. Are we clear? Huh? Ati? You mean the area? Uh, the no, the area, boss, you get a torch. You know what a torch is? I don't know if the load shading has reduced or something like that, but you get a torch. Okay, you put batteries in this torch, you get your shop, you buy a torch, then you switch on this torch, then you shine the light from the torch on a wall. Okay? There's going to be a space where the light from the torch is going to shine when it's dark. Okay? So that area where the light is shining, that is your A. That's the area we're talking about. Okay? Then you're going to be standing at a particular distance from the light from the wall with your torch. The distance from the torch to the wall, that is our arrow. Are we clear? This arrow. This is our arrow. You're imagining your torch is at the center here. Then you switch it on. Then it shines this area. This whole area here. This is your A. Okay? This whole area. This is your A. Then the distance from the torch to the area, this is your arrow. Okay? That's how you get a solid angle. The area divided by the radius, the radius, this arrow is the distance from the source of light to the area. Are we clear? Okay, so unless there are any, unless there are any other questions, we need to come to an end here. Uh, I, I'm hoping that the recording has come out nicely this time around. I'll confirm very, very shortly. If it has come out nicely, then I'll be able to upload it to your Moodle. Okay. So when we meet next week, we're going to start looking at uh, these SI deri uh, these derived quantities. How do you come up with them? You have the notes on Moodle, so please try to go through the notes. Where you don't understand, mark where you don't understand so that you can ask questions during the class. Okay, so next time we meet, I think it's going to be on... Is it on Monday? Or Tuesday? Monday? Yeah, Monday or Tuesday, that's when our next class is going to be. So we're going to look at SI derived, quanti uh, derived quantities and also those things. Ati? Yes. I can't hear any questions. If there are no questions, then we have to stop. Yes. I'm not hearing anything. Andy, are you saying something? Yes, Elijah. Yes, I'm saying something. Yeah, what is it? Okay, we need to come to an end. We need to come to an end. Ma my band was here. Okay, we need to come to an end. So I'll finish.